the subject matter chosen by Maurizio is uh, something like not knowing and spontaneity. So if I had prepared something, I would be knowing something and I wouldn't be spontaneous. So our meeting is going to be an exercise in spontaneity and uh, spontaneous question will trigger spontaneous answers, hopefully. If there are any questions to disentangle after this week of entanglement uh, or about entanglement, uh, I'm not an expert on entanglement or disentanglement for that matter, but uh, your questions are welcome. Yes? Hi, Francis. So today uh, I attended a talk on free will from the quantum mechanics point of view. So what is free will? What does quantum mechanics say about free will? You should have attended that lecture. That, what? You should have attended that lecture, because it was... So, le let's talk, uh, let's try to talk about free will without going into quantum mechanics and the free will of particles or of waves. And the I'm, I'm looking for an answer from consciousness's point of view. Yeah. The, the first, the question about free will is ambiguous. Free will for whom? We have to be precise. Usually what is meant in the question is free will for a human being, for a separate entity, for an individual entity. In fact, such an individual entity, a body-mind, is devoid of free will. You can see that within by seeing how thoughts arise in you. They arise without you pre-choosing them, they arise unchosen. You have nothing to say. You are not in control of those arising thoughts. Otherwise, you could choose to be perfectly happy, right? Or perfectly intelligent, or perfectly to behave perfectly in all circumstances, never get angry, etc. Obviously, it's not the case. Therefore, experience shows that as a separate entity, entity, we are not in control of our thoughts. So as a separate entity, experientially, there is no free will. We are like Coke vending machines. The universe presses the various buttons. It's hot and dry, I get thirsty. Someone tells me you're stupid, I punch the guy in the face. You know, it's just, I put my dollar and I choose diet zero or regular, right? Or root beer or whatever. The same. So we are, as human beings, we are like coke vending machines, basically. However, we have this sense of freedom that somehow decisions are us, are ours, and that understanding is ours. If we understand something, the decisions that flows from this understanding, we own it fully. You see, if in a given situation, we clearly see what we should be doing, and if our heart and our intelligences and, and the intelligence are in agreement. 
then we have at the same time the feeling that this decision is truly ours, that it comes from our freedom. Therefore, that point at really an identity between intelligence or understanding, heart or love, and freedom. A place in us from which this kind of decision originate, originates. And that's a place of freedom and also a place of spontaneity in us to please Maurizio, yes, that I can kind of address the topic, you know, just, <laughs> and you need to fulfill the mission. So, but this place of freedom in us is not personal. It is beyond the person. And that's the big discovery of all this business, in fact, about whatever enlightenment, the spiritual path. The big discovery is this place of freedom in us, this place of intelligence, of love, of understanding, of consciousness. And the liberation is the discovery that this place, or this reality that perceives, understands, loves, decides, is universal rather than personal that in fact it is the universe who contemplates itself through all these eyes, who, who hears herself through all these ears. You know, that's symbolically the, the myth, you know, when in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna uh, unveils for Arjuna its frightening, uh, body, his real body, with many eyes and many arms. That's what he, is meant, in fact. That we all these eyes here, all of our eyes, are the eyes of the eyes, E-Y-E-S, right? Are the eyes of one single seer. That's a great discovery. And this seer is freedom itself. Please. But when I'm a separate self, what? When I'm a separate self, or if I if I'm in the space of being a separate self, there is a sense of personal will, of taking actions, for example, driving here? Yes. And so are you saying that there is no free will or there's free will only when you're separate? You can see, I was, I was trying to, to point to the fact that, in fact, this, this freedom as a separate body-mind is an illusion since we don't choose our thoughts. When we make a decision, it comes as a thought. If we don't choose our thoughts, we don't choose our decisions either. So the, the freedom we have as a separate self is an illusory freedom. It's like when I was a kid, as a toy, there were these mock wheels because the kids at the time, there were no safety belts and they were allowed to sit on the passenger seat next to the driver. So we had these little mock wheels that we would stuck to the, to the dashboard and the kid would follow the father. You know, so the, the, the road would turn to the left, it would turn left, turn right, turn right. And then all of a sudden the, the road would turn left and the kid would try to turn right to no avail and discover that his freedom to steer the car was a mock freedom, was not real. That's what happens here. We believe to be free up until you, we come to places like here. Then we realize that we believe to be in control, but we aren't in control. 
So, another follow-up. So You are not in control of these questions that you are not going to. <laughs> so, if I was going to decide between having a glass of beer or coming to Francis's talk, you're saying that's happening autom autonomically, and it's, it's only afterwards that I, my mind exactly. says that this is what's you the claim, decision I made. You claim the, deci the decidership, or you claim the the authorship or the claim, the doership, as an afterthought. My, my teacher was using this beautiful analogy of the clown who takes a bow after the ballerina has performed to, to take the applause to, to himself, whereas he has not performed, right? But he takes a bow. And it, this illusory entity which comes after an after, as, as an afterthought claims to be the decider, claims to be the doer. Hi Francis. Um, I know that a really common question uh, spiritual teachers often get is, you know, what to do with our emotions and um, how to witness them and n not to judge ourselves. And I've heard some of your talks about not judging your judgment and just like you wouldn't judge the storm. And um, while I find these to be immensely helpful, I was wondering if you could give us a little journey of your own personal evolution through your emotions. like how they started, like how bad they were in the beginning and how they've changed throughout your awakening. Um, I'm trying to just paint a picture of a long-term emotional <laughs> evolution. <laughs> of course, <laughs> what you're referring to are the negative emotion, right? To, to, to be in tears, upon listening to a beautiful music or being the witness of a beautiful act of love is not pro a problem, right? So you are referring to negative emotions. And uh, the first thing I would say is to, to realize that these negative emotions can always be traced back to the belief to be a, the belief that we are a separate entity. Uh, only a fragment, a separate entity can feel threatened by people, by events, uh, which triggers negative emotions or by a potential lack of something, lack of being loved, lack of being recognized. Because if I am not loved, I am in danger, you know, like a child. So all of these negative emotions, they are like, like various uh, 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 elements hanging from the ceiling through a single cable at the root, and the single cable being this belief to be a separate entity. To deal with our emotions one by one, retail, so to, so to speak, is not going to be very efficient because the moment we have not eliminated the root cause, even if after 10 years of therapy or whatever, we have been able to master a specific type of problem or psychological problem or emotion, uh, manage our anger or our addiction or whatever, the fact that the, the source of all emotions is still running uh, will create brand new ones instantaneously. 
So the, once we understand this, we change our process and we try to deal directly with, with the source of all emotions, which is the sense of being a separate consciousness, a separate self. And then it has been my experience that these negative emotions, they, they vanish without us having to do really anything specific about them, about any of them. That's why I, I don't really do psychology. For instance, since you, you ask about personal experience, in my case, the apparent reason that took me to the spiritual search, I was a scientist, I was a materialist, I was an atheist by formation and also by tradition from my parents. And uh, I was experiencing problems when I was in social situations with people, with women, especially with young and beautiful women. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to solve this problem. And uh, one day I went to, in Paris, I went to this bookstore and I was looking at the psychology display, you know, for a solution to this problem that when you are in your 20s, you know, is an important one. And <laughs> And that's when I picked up this book, that the spine of which was Krishnamurti, this was, there was some Indian flavor to it that somehow resonated with me. And then I read the book. And then almost instantaneously I understood that it was useless to try to deal with my shyness or my specific problem. I became interested in what I am, you know, and it's a big question. And I didn't think very much about this problem. It seemed to me that it was there, but I didn't take any steps about it. And perhaps two years later, one day I realized that 90% of this problem had disappeared without me doing anything about it. So the best way to deal with your emotion, to put it in a nutshell, is be interested in the big picture let go of the small pictures, the big picture will take care of the small pictures. Thank you. Um, hi. I seem to have this, well, according to you, I'm laboring under a delusion that I have free will. I, but I cannot hear well. I seem to be laboring. I don't know if I have free will, but I seem to be laboring under this delusion that I do. And, you know, I had an awakening where I saw myself, you know, one with everything. And I, it felt like I chose a certain path. I chose to not, when I realized how important it was that my thoughts were that I chose to not go down the path of unforgiveness and to dwell in places where I knew what would be at the end of that path. And, and this seems to work for me to, I don't know if it's true that I do have free will, but it seems to work for me to make a conscious effort to look at my, like meditate, and so that I have the ability to like observe my thought patterns that, um, that are very repetitive. And to me, that has worked for me to believe that I have a choice. Like my thoughts are very, I have the same thoughts over and over and over and I notice that when I meditate. And so slowly when I see that, I seem to be able to choose, oh, I see that and then just kind of have some space between me and these repetitive thoughts and that seems to kind of cure it and to keep me from um, being the way I was before I had this. And to me, that's very different than what you're saying. 
I don't know if I understood you correctly, so um, did I understand you correctly? Or what do you think of my... What, what, what's your, I, I'm not getting do you your think question. That, I believe, do you think that um, people have free will to choose to, like, forgive or choose to believe that the world is friendly? Because I seem to believe that, whereas before I would choose to believe that you know, I have to stay angry at people to protect myself and oh, yes. that sort of thing. You have the choice to believe. And you have the choice not to believe. Belief is always an option. Because a, a belief is not a fact. Uh, belief is something for which you have no evidence, but that nonetheless you choose to validate as being true. You know, for instance, uh, uh, we don't have direct evidence that some miracle happened in the distant past. We can choose to believe that it was true, even in the absence of, I don't know, of a, a video or solid evidence. But there is always something flimsy when we believe in that way, you see. Uh, there is a big difference between beliefs and experience. Uh, lasting peace can only be achieved through experience, never through belief. Could you say that again? Lasting peace can only be achieved through experience not through belief, because beliefs are never secure. But it seemed to um, play out that when I, um, before I had the experience and I just didn't watch my thoughts, you know, I just let them kind of go down that road that there would be, at the end of the road, there would be result, and I could see that. And so I've chosen to um, be mindful and to meditate and to notice patterns of my thinking. And that seems to go down another path that has served me a lot better. And so to me, that is kind of like a internal test that I've used in my own life to say, okay, I can change the way I think and it results in this thing over here. And I can see how the other way, you know, was not a good experience for me. As I said earlier, it, it depends on what you mean by I. Who is it who can change the thoughts? When I speak to you, I don't speak to a machine. I speak to that which really understands. And I speak to that which is free. And to that which is free to choose. I don't speak to something which is dead and doesn't understand. Therefore, I speak to the consciousness in you. And this consciousness in you is free, free to choose, free to even to seek itself, free to, at the end of the search, to recognize itself and to reveal itself to itself. So there is freedom, yes. And uh, your desire for the truth, whatever took you here, comes from this place of freedom. The mistake we make is to believe that that which is free in us is a body-mind, is a woman, a man, a human being, a separate entity. Oh, I, I, I get what you're saying. There's this aspect of the infinite that is kind of more than just this person here. That, yes. Okay, that, I get it. That which perceives a person is not a person. That which perceives the limitations is not limited. Okay. <laughs> I, I cannot hear. Now, yes? Yes. Good, good. Um, 
Are thoughts and perceptions possible when the physical body is no longer activated in what we call life? The, the perceptions, the question is, for consciousness, which is the absolute reality, completely free to create, is this free reality coerced to perceive solely through a body? Why limit God's infinity? However, from that point of view, is it possible for that which is considered to be thought to carry a line of linear, what I call thinking, of um, a thought and a consequence and a further thought when the physical structure is no longer active. Like I sometimes think of the brain and the body I, as I the software. I understand. You, you, if we come from the vantage point, that matter is primeval and that thought is created by matter, then, of course, the end of the body means the end of thought, right? But our point of departure is not a scientific one. The conclusion we reach, right, if it is true that matter and body and brain creates thought, then when the body is dead, thinking is dead. The logic is impeccable. However, the input, which is implicit in the question, yes. according to which matter creates thought, that is questionable. You see, it is, it is a form of religion. There is no scientific evidence that matter creates thought. It's a form of religion. What is obvious is that there seems to be a two-way correspondence between thought and matter, since uh, some physical phenomena can have an impact of, of our thinking on, onto our thinking, and conversely, if I decide to raise a hand, I can raise my hand, so this thought seems to be causally followed by an event in, in, the, in, the, in the physical universe. So there seems to be this two-way interaction between matter and thought. However, there is a third possibility, which is that they are both co-created from a different source, from a different reality that creates both, both thought and matter, and that explains that explain then the, inter, the consistency between the two. You see, that's the non-dualist hypothesis. Uh, if there is only one single reality, it is the same reality that creates the physical universe, sustains it, and that creates also mind and sustains it. So then this interconsistency between thought and matter, or this correspondence between thought and matter, is explained away in a non-materialist, materialist, and also in a non-idealist fashion. Thank you. And from that perspective, could it be stated, perhaps, that the soul has likened unto it... That the soul? The soul, the, what some religions might call soul, uh, S-O-U-L, um, has unto it an aspect of being, just like the particle has the wave, 
and that part of the soul that is likened unto the wave, to the particle, allows for the, what we, well, what I, in a very limited type of thinking mind way, might think of as parallel um, experiences, since that which you speak of comes from a place of non-time and space, couldn't it be that that could explain the parallel lives theory of um, beingness incarnated in more than one place at a time because time and space don't really matter and that level of which we were speaking a moment ago? Well, you, I, I'm afraid you have lost me a little bit. The, oh. the, but my, my answer is going to, to be gratifying. Ev everything is possible. Yes, okay. Raise your hand. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, given that there is no free will, Thank you, Pam. given that there is no free will, and given that uh, we seem to be following some kind of historic predetermined things which are there in our brain which we consider as us. There seems to be no point in really having an ambition or going after anything or doing anything. I mean, what's, if there is no free will which I can choose to be a doctor or an engineer, I could be anything. And uh, still, I mean, I'm just lost that when there's no free will, What's the point of living? What's the point of? Living. You didn't listen carefully enough to what I said. <laughs> I didn't say there is no free will period and there are witnesses to that. <laughs> I said the bad news is that as a separate entity, we have no free will. The good news, however, is that we are not a separate entity. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah. Oh, wait. We have oh. two mics. From a non-dual perspective, uh, when you play tennis, do you keep score? And it, yes. And if so, and if, if so, who wins? What? Who wins and who loses? Who wins and who loses? If I, if I play tennis? Who wins and who loses? Oh, the, the winner is the loser and the loser is the winner. Very good. <laughs> oh. Francis? Um, you mentioned lasting peace, and I just wondered if you believe in that. Is that your experience? If I believe? In lasting peace? I don't believe. Uh, me either. Just checking. <laughs> Thank you. Doesn't mean there is no lasting peace. But it can only be an experience, not a belief. What's the use of a belief? It's useless stuff. The, the lasting peace is not a personal experience. It's our common background. It's our common substance. Nobody can claim it as a person, as a separate entity. It is our home. It is, well, it is a home we have never left. Just we dream we have left it. Sorry, it's me again. So, if, if I understood you correctly when you were answering... What, what, what? If I understood you correctly when you were answering the question about therapy... About? Therapy. 
C'est Emotional, okay. psychological conditioning. What you're saying, just to clarify, is that when I am aware, when I'm in the presence of my own awareness, then that takes care of all the conditioning that may have accumulated. Addictions, sins, I don't know, greed, seven deadly sins. So by going for the big picture, you're saying stay in that, abide in that sense, and the other stuff will take care of itself. Okay. The, the priority is to go for the big picture first. And then you can, once you have dealt with the root cause, let's assume you have a tree that every, you don't, an olive tree, and you don't like to have all these olives on your lawn, right? And you can choose, of course, to clean your lawn, to pick the olives one by one. But you can choose also, it's more efficient, to cut the tree. Then you can remove the olives. You're certain they're not going to come back. However, if you just pick the olives, right? <laughs> if you just pick the olives, next year you have a new crop. So that's the same with those negative emotions. You first have to deal with the root cause and then you can deal with the symptoms. And, and the root cause being? The belief to be a separate consciousness. Right. First we have to see that that which we really are is this presence which is hearing these words right here. And then to ask the question, how do I know that this presence is separate, that it is dependent upon a body? Because I know that this presence is real. Think about it. If consciousness were not real, how could I have access to anything real through consciousness? How could something which is not real perceive reality? It's not possible. Uh, to, 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 take a, to use a mathematical met metaphor, uh, consciousness is at least as real, at least as real as everything it perceives. If, if not the same thing. What? If not the same thing. If not the same thing, whatever. But, but there is a a blatant element of reality to consciousness. We cannot deny it. In fact, that's the only thing we can be absolutely certain of. That, that, that's the only certainty we can ever have. That's why Socrates, Socrates said, you know, I know, I know nothing. He was not completely true. He knew he was. I know I am, but besides that, I know nothing. Really? The rest is of a lesser level of certainty than the knowing of consciousness. The problem is that in materialism we have turned that around. We believe that matter is more real than that which perceives matter. And besides, we don't know what matter is. And that's why the more, the more materialists, the, the ones who are, the, are not the physicists whose job it is to study matter, because they know they don't know. However, when you go up the food chain, chemists, biochemists, uh, biologists, and then psychologists, and then sociologists, the farther away you go on the food chain in academia from physics, the more they believe that the buck stops with the physicist, and that the physicist has the key. But the physicists, they know they don't know. 
It's a house of cards. What's time? What's space? What's matter? What's a, what's a wave function? What's a four-dimensional manifold? What's a energy stress tensor? What's a Hilbert space? These are words. Very complicated. I was, before coming here, I was thinking, if I had to explain entanglement, how could I do that? Because it was a subject. I came up with something like, you have two subsystems, S1, S2, of dimensions D1 and D2. If they don't interact, right, more or less, but if you put them, consider them together, the dimension of the Hilbert space is going to be D1 plus D2. However, if they interact, it's going to be D, D1 times D2. So that gives much more freedom to the system. That's the entanglement, right? That then, instead of having a simple tensorial product, we have a sum, a linear combination of tensorial product of the state vectors. I hope you got it. <laughs> that was basically some explanation of what matter is. So I'd like to look at our title, which is Innocence and Spontaneity. And what is consciousness's relationship to innocence? Or what is innocence? Meister Eckhart defines to be what is to be poor in spirit, which is the same as innocent. And he says, one is, is, poor, in spirit, is poor in spirit who knows nothing owns nothing, means is attached to nothing, and wants nothing. Which is in fact a definition of consciousness. Consciousness is not attached to anything, just as a mirror is not attached to any reflection that appears within it. It lets them come, it lets them go, it lets them be. So innocence is our true nature, in fact. That's why as children, young children, we are innocent, we lose it. And then hopefully, we go back to it. And with innocence comes peace and happiness. I thought he, he was hinting at some time limitations in this illusion of a... Yes, okay. Seven minutes. Five minutes. Two words. One more question. Okay, one more question. Sorry, I, I was getting to feel and then I dropped it. Can you mind us stand up? Oh, yeah. Francis, what can we do to facilitate collective enlightenment transformation or awakening? What, what? What can we do, we do, to facilitate collective enlightenment? We need to, first, to help ourselves and to be happy before trying to make the universe happy. Who would go to a therapist who is depressed? <laughs> what sense does it make? See what I mean? So, first help yourself before you help the world. You know, in terms of happiness, there are other areas of help, of course, when you don't need to be happy. But if you want to help the world in terms of happiness, which is kind of essential, it seems to me, 
you first have to secure it for yourself, right? And then hopefully if it overflows, then it will go into the world. You see, the problem is that the world has known a lot of people who were wanted to save the world, like Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot. They all have the perfect solution to save the world. They should have saved themselves first. <laughs> I tend, you know, when I, when I hear people telling me, or telling us, they are going to save the world, I tend to take it with a grain of salt. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>